launch YouTube. All right, we're live on YouTube and I'm gonna open up the webinar and we're live, we're on. Welcome friends, we're gonna get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. Hello everybody. We'll let the attendees fill the room here. Good morning. All right. Good morning. All right, I'm gonna jump in with some announcements. Um, hopefully this is working. Yes, okay, here we go. Good morning, friends. Welcome to the San Francisco Public Library Virtual Library. We are excited here today to be partnering with the Mexican Museum, our continued partnership, and we hope to continue in the future as well. So this is part of our Summer Stride events and Summer Stride is not just for youth. So you can join up and do your 20 hours of reading and get your iconic San Francisco Public Library tote bag with that beautiful art you see there from Kehlani Juanita who is a Bay Area children's illustrator and amazing human being. We wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we live. Our library is committed to uplifting the names of these community members and nations with whom we live together. We encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and later on, I'm gonna put a link into the chat box where you can find a giant reading list on first person culture and land rights, resources and reading list. I wanna just tell you about some quick library info. We have a bi-monthly read at our library that's been going on for years and years. It's called On the Same Page. And we are celebrating the work of Jacqueline Woodson and reading Red at the Bone. Jacqueline Woodson is a renowned children's author and YA author, that's young adult. And she will be in our virtual library on August 12th discussing her youth focused work. But this is an adult book, so check it out at your local location and we'll have a book club as well. Tomorrow, academics talking about the Black Panther Tales of Wakanda. Super excited about this one, it should be very fun. On July 30th, we're gonna be doing some styrofoam printing with our local favorite art artist, Ali Bloom. Uh, the 28th, we have the Tenderloin Museum and San Francisco Neon, and the director of Letterform Archive joining us to talk about neon and fonts on matchbooks. So that should be interesting. And I don't know if you know that San Francisco Public Library has a jail and re-entry services department. This, our department is a very small team, but mighty work they do. And we serve all the jails in San Francisco with actual going into the jail services, providing books and resources. But we also do reference by mail for all of the jails west of Mississippi. So they are a super important department. department. And they also help folks um, who are released get back in uh, with reentry services, job services, and things like that, housing, et cetera. But this film is about social justice and um, restorative justice movement and takes place in San Quentin. So very local, San Quentin's in our backyard. And um, just how, how we serve these citizens that are our citizens and our community. So come check this film out. All right, well, I would like to introduce Bertha Rodriguez from the Mexican Museum, and she's gonna give us a little info, an update about what's happening at the museum. Bertha. Hi everyone, thank you Anisa, Anisa for inviting us. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we are very happy to partner once again with the San Francisco Public Libraries on the Summer Stride Programming for 2021. Uh, promoting our digital exhibitions, which is an effort that seeks to showcase the work of internationally renowned Mexican, Mexican-American, Latin American, and Chicano artists. For those who don't know us, uh, 
I'll share a bit of history. The Mexican Museum was founded in 1975. And since then, and throughout its history, the museum has adapted to diverse dynamics that affect the communities that surround us. Our permanent collection comprises outstanding pieces by Mexican, Mexican American, Latin American, and Chicano artists, and as well as collections from Latin America, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, as we are right now currently undergoing a process of reconfiguration that uh, will result in an expansion of our galleries. And our main purpose is to serve as an axis of unity and diversion for the Hispanic community in the California Bay Area and the United States. We're very happy to have our exterior uh, completed, which marks a major milestone uh, in the development of the New Mexican Museum. And like many construction projects, uh, we have experienced delays due to COVID related uh, construction and logistic challenges. Uh, but we plan to welcome the community in the new space in the near future. In the meantime, our teams continue to drive process forward. And in addition to completion of the exterior, the Mexican Museum has secured uh, new collections and we are actively planning the first exhibits uh, for the new space. We welcome your support and we invited you to visit our website, uh, www.mexicanmuseum.org to see our exhibits. Um, and if you wanna donate, uh, go to support. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. So good to hear an update on what's happening. I know San Francisco has been waiting a long time and we are still waiting. We are very excited and, and definitely want to support the Mexican Museum. All right, we are in for a treat today. I am um, so in love with the work of this artist, Naum B. Zanel, um, gorgeous work. So we are in for a treat because we have a scholar who has richly studied his work. Um, Sofia Solis has uh, obtained her, their doctor of philosophy from Autonomous University of Barcelona, and uh, their PhD is on Nahum Zanil. Uh, Solis is a researcher of, at Communication Department at the Autonomous University of Aguaja, Aguas Calina, ah, Calientes. Yes. <laughs> I'm the worst, I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, they have developed different postdoctoral projects in Mexico, Slovakia, Academy of Performative Arts, Slovak, Slovak Academy of Sciences, and Latvia Academy of Latvian Culture. How exciting. Um, Solis has a linked cross-cutting study of cinema and gender and has published articles relating to feminist film theory and decolonial thinking in audiovisual media. That is such an awesome um, lineup of what you do, so, uh, Sophia. So I am so excited to have your knowledge and to share what you know about Naum Zanil. And I'm gonna turn it over now. Okay. Sophia, thank you for being oh, here today. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Anissa, and thank you, the San Francisco Public Library. And also thank you to the Mexican Museum again for the invitation. I'm like um, over the top to share with you my research and also to share with you the work of the Maestro Naum. Um, this research took me around four years to complete. And um, this also gave me the chance to, to meet the Maestro. He was very kind, inviting me into his home back in Tenango del Aire. And he showed me some of his pieces and I was like very happy to see some of these paintings in person. So, um, Let's start. I'm going to share my screen, please, Anissa, if you can tell me if everything is okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing. Looks good, looks good. 
Okay, perfect. So if you haven't visited, uh, you haven't visited the, the online exhibition of the museum, please visit it. It's a very good chance to get to know the, the work of the maestro. Uh, it has a beautiful text from Black Caversial. Uh, it's very well written. And I think it's a very good opportunity to meet, to, to, meet, to approach uh, the work of the maestro. It's also beautifully uh, selected here. And I also uh, gave a talk back in December last year, um, also about the work of the maestro. This uh, talk was in Spanish language, but I think if you want, uh, you can understand most of it. Uh, anyway, I will talk briefly about what I said back then. Okay, so let's go to the presentation. So the first thing we have to have in mind when we approach or, or when we enter to one exhibition from the Maestro Naum is that he has a very uh, solid discourse about self-representation. So it's like 99% of his pieces are self-portrait. So he's very committed to this self-narrative. Um, so we need to have this in mind because we are entering to this exhibition and we only see these self-portraits. Okay, so this, this, is, this is very important. I, I, I wanted to highlight this, this before we start. Then when I started uh, uh, my research, I found out that there were two main interpretations of his work. Uh, on one side, they were telling the art historians were saying that um, his work was a confession that uh, something very deep, like he was telling a secret that he cannot tell by speaking words, but he was um, painting this secret, you know, through this, uh, his artistic career, he was uh, telling this secret, confessing this secret. And for me, this kind of interpretation was not reaching, you know, the political poten potential that I think his work had. And in the other side, the other as art historians, because they were divided, uh, they were saying that his work was, um, was related to exhibitionism. He was making some eschatological versions of himself, you know, and he was showing off he, his, uh, you know, because there, there were a lot of nudes. And the, this interpretation also was related um, to one exhibition he made at the end of the 90s in the, modern, in the modern Museum of Art in Mexico City that was called El Gran Circo del Mundo. And to enter this exhibition, there was a, like a big installation, like a big uh, printing or illustration, let's say, of a mouth. It was his mouth. So it was a big, like a big entrance. So you were entering to his mouth and let's say through his body. So you see all these paintings and there were paintings like uh, he was sitting in the toilet, for example, or he was taking a bath or something. So when you are going to like exit the exhibition, you were exiting through uh, like another big installation. It was like an illustration of his anus. So you were entering to his mouth and through his body and exiting through his anus, right? So this exhibition, exhibitionism, you know, interpretation, exhibitionist, uh, it was related to this um, exhibition, right? And the, and the modern Mexican, uh, modern art museum. So, for me, both, there were like not enough uh, or not lacking this uh, political content that I think his work has, like he's very strong. So I entered to study his work and also I entered studying his life. So I found for me two moments in his life that determine uh, his work, his artistic work, okay? The first one is his childhood. He's from a very small town in Mexico, in, in the state of Veracruz. It's a very conservative town, very small and very religious one, okay? So from that moment, he grew up with his mom and his grandmother and um, this very, you know, environment of con uh, this conservative, like strong um, environment. So from that, from that moment, he retrieved some of the elements that we can still see in his work. For example, the Mexican folklore, we can see in this painting, the Mexican Loteria, that is one that, that I'm showing now. I think I can put a uh, full screen, okay. This one, the Loteria. And he retrieved these elements 
from 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 that period, all right? And also the religious one, this uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. When he was a child, he had a vision uh, of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and from that moment, he was like very uh, he's devoted to to the Virgin, okay? So the second moment in his life is when he moved out of Veracruz in in to Mexico City. Uh, he was. Uh, he, he, he wanted to be a teacher, so he moved to have this formal education as a professor. He worked as a professor during 20 years, actually. And uh, maybe at the end of the 60s, he enrolled also in the school that, that is called La Esmeralda, which is one of the most prestigious fine arts schools in Mexico that is currently in the National Center of Arts in Mexico City. And in that moment in Mexico, what's happening, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things were happening in Mexico, but at that time, let's say uh, the 70s or something, uh, what's happening, the rupture. The rupture, let's see, the rupture is an artistic movement that uh, was coming from the 50s and get, uh, got stronger uh, through time. And in the 70s was, was like really strong in Mexico. It was like strong influence and a strong tendency in Mexico. So um, the rupture is called like that because it's a breaking moment away. It's a breaking away moment, sorry, from the Escuela Mexicana. So, you know, La Escuela Mexicana is what we know as the muralist. And that was formed by Rivera, Siqueiros and Orozco and other like, other paintings, painters, and this Escuela Mexicana was full of political propaganda, was born after the, re the revolution in the 1930s and 1940s, and it was, uh, let's say, it was part of a, like a big plan from the state, from the government, to create, after the revolution, uh, this new Mexican modern, modern Mexican identity, you know, it was like, rebuild this identity and uh, they the plan was to create this new 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 one modern modern identity and the escuela mexicana was part it was like uh, they were in charge to give this um il to illustrate this new mexican to give this uh, representation of this mexican new mexicanity let's say so the rupture was breaking away with this uh, political propaganda. And they were looking into what was happening in Europe and the US. So what was happening in Europe and the US was the avant-garde. The avant-garde were, were related to performance and music and stuff, but abstractionism was very strong also. So um, in Mexico, there was a big influence from abstractionism and also the maestro, uh, at first, experimented with that. He explored this, um, let's say, this tendency. But at the end, uh, he decided that it was not like, it was not, uh, this abstractionism was not giving him the enough elements to express what he wanted to express. Uh, so he went back to figurative painting. And from that moment, let's say, during the 70s, late 70s, he uh, started to paint what we see now. So he has uh, like many years painting like this, a um, few decades now doing this self-narrative, constructing this self-narrative through this time. Actually, one of the biggest critics that he received is that he's, he was not changing, you know, the topic or even exploring another technique, you know, because uh, if you see, uh, for example, he has this sepia colored paper that for me, it, it reminds me like these old textbooks from when I was in primary school or high school, this, uh, this textbook from the state. Uh, so it's, it, it has this um, feeling of nostalgia, for example. So uh, he was not changing techniques. He was not exploring another topics. So it was the biggest critic. Um, like he was lacking some creativity, for example. Uh, but no, for me, it was like, he is really committed. He's sticking to his self-narrative and it's like very solid and very political. Okay, so from the late seventies, he's painting like this. He's painting, you know, he's sticking to this self-representation narrative. Okay, so 
after this, after the rupture, after the 70s in Mexico during the 90s, because he, he um, the maestro got more, more recognition in the art circles during the 90s, he won several prizes in Mexico. So during the 90s, um, he got more recognition, but the 90s in Mexico were like, there was a big social struggle. Uh, we, we still had in mind this, uh, this picture, for example, it was the, the, students, the student move, movement in the 1968, it was a massacre, if you know it. And we still, we, we still have this in, in our memory, right? Also, the lesbian and lesbian and gay and gay right movements were getting stronger, and they started in the 70s. Also, during the 90s, were more visible. And also, during the 90s, in the middle of the 90s, um, the government decided uh, to go full in this uh, neoliberalism, right? So, change to to bet entirely to this uh, new, let's say, proposal. It is not new proposal, but okay, we enter to this new era, let's say, of neoliberalism. So they, the, the president signed this uh, uh, free trade treat, treatment and that the, the treaty. And at the same time, uh, the, you know, the EZLN, the guerrilla in Chiapas, uh, started you know so uh, this um this entering to the to the treaty to the, the neoliberalism was uh, demonstrated this um both both side of mexican of, Me of mexico of sorry of mexico you know in on the one side uh, we wanted to be modern we wanted to go into you know globalization to go you know into these new markets of the global north let's say, and in the other side, we, uh, we had a lot of uh, inequality, social poverty, and a lot of uh, social issues. So it was like a very strong moment in Mexico during the 90s. And all the artists, especially the maestro, I think the maestro uh, got into this discourse, like uh, arguing, also discussing or questioning this, um, let's say modern values, okay? So these modern values came after the revolution, you know, like I told you, after the revolution, the government started, started with like a big discourse, like a Wagnerian dream, you know, from culture, education, politics, and everything, you know, was around this discourse. And so the new identity, the modern Mexican came from this period. So the master is not responding to this period itself, but he's, he's um, questioning the identity that came with these values, okay? So after the revolution, the same party um, governed Mexico during 70 years until the, until the end of the century, actually. So um, the, the, the feeling, the social feeling that, that the, the society, the community, was uh, showing non-conformity with these values. Also, you know, with these uh, demonstrations and everything that we had in our memory. And also the maestro getting to that. He was questioning his, uh, this identity from his side, of course. And he started to paint this. Um, this and he started to like responding to this, uh, to this Mexican identity. Okay. So, um, in his work, we can see a lot of Mexican symbols like the flag. He constantly, constantly put the, fla the flag, the Mexican flag in these paintings. For example, this one, I think it's very strong. This, is, this painting is not in the, in the catalog of the online, online exhibition, but I think it's a very strong story because it, uh, usually he, I mean, he always paint like uh, sepia colored, you know, uh, paintings. But this one, I, I think I struck this one. I extracted this one from my my PhD dissertation, so it's uh, like uh, black and white. But I think it's very strong. Uh, the name is uh, like um, I am Mexican too. And with this one, I think he's uh, questioning this kind of uh, this this identity on how to be a man. 
you know what what were what were the values that you know determine this gender identity okay so we can see like a lot of um examples of this uh, response for example in the in the left we have the prisionero so he's sitting down in this chair like it seems to be a colonial wooden chair and he's tied up with this uh, mexican ribbon so he's like naked he cannot move he's vulnerable so i think it's clear the message is clear and also in this one like uh, soy puro mexicano he's showing these wounds that uh, that that um, that came with this uh, you know identity modern identity that is deeply discriminatory okay so he was questioning this uh, sorry so he was questioning this for example this painting i love this painting it's called o santa bandera it's a triptych Sorry if I put only two. Uh, in the middle one is just a flagpole. Um, so this one, um, this painting was actually removed from the from one exhibition in the Museo del Chopo, which is a university museum from the UNAM. It was removed, removed. It was censored from the from the exhibition, which was a gay 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 and lesbian festival. So uh, it was a demonstration from the community and they put back in the, this painting. So this is a strong painting. Um, it's one of the paintings that for me inspired my, my PhD dissertation that I think is very strong and very political. Okay, so he was questioning this uh, modern identity on how to be a man, or what, what, um, what were the features of the, um, or, or the characteristics of, um, that were descri describing the Mexican man, all right? So uh, this is the fun theoretical part. Uh, to explain this and my argument in my PhD dissertation, I used uh, the theory of performativity that I think you, you are very familiar with in San Francisco. Uh, it was exposed by Judith Butler and says that a gender is performance, right? It's a performance since we embody the cultural definitions of gender, okay? So they are cultural because they belong to a specific culture. They are definitions because they are rooted into language and language define everything, all right? Define everything in the, so in the social and uh, subjective reality. So we embody these cultural definitions of gender and we also speak, you know, define or determine through language these also these cultural definitions. Okay, so sexual identity is um it's a construction, it's a process. So it's a let's say a historical process because it's constructed through time through time. So uh, if we think uh, it's a process, let's think that these cultural definitions are like citations or are, are like pins. So every time we embody certain cultural definitions, we cite or we quote or we pin to a gender norm. So there are hundreds, hundreds of um, uh, definitions of gender. So um, and sexual identity is constructed through the reiteration or through the repetition of this um, cultural cultural definitions of gender, right? So it is through these repetitions uh, that uh, sexual identity is constructed. Okay, so the logic, the inner logic of this uh, process is the relationship of these three terms, sex, gender, and desire. Desire meaning the sexual orientation, right? So sex, let's say, uh, the maestro was questioning this um, modern identity, right? So this modern identity was defined like this, sex as a male, gender as masculine, desire as a heterosexual or straight, as you want. So this one was a, the gender norm in Mexico. 
So if you live outside of you don't assume or you don't appropriate properly or fully or entirely this gender norm, you live in the margins, you live, you are outcast from the social acknowledgement. So uh, this is like, for me, it's um, deeply, deeply discriminatory, right? So uh, in my work, I also think that the maestro was going beyond and uh, there was a deep relationship between sexual identity and the national identity. So to this formula, to this equation, I, I add up this uh, cultural belonging. So let's say the master was questioning how to be a man or how to be recognized as a man. But I think he was questioning this, um, how to be a Mexican man or how to be, uh, how to be recognizable as a Mexican man. Okay, so the formula was the following. Sex as a male, gender as um, masculine, desire as heterosexual, and the cultural belonging as macho. So you have to be male, masculine, heterosexual, and macho to be recognized as a sexual, as a Mexican man. So as you can see, this is like a very conservative, hard, monolithic statement, uh, gender norm, also gender norm. So I think the maestro was using the same mechanism of uh, performativity. He was performing also his um, new identity. So he, in every painting, he was like doing this uh, quotation or citation of himself. So let's think in like, you know, these many years of painting or, or with the self portraits. So he's like, uh, quoting himself again and again and again in every painting. So he's uh, like constructing his identity. He's like, uh, uh, you know, getting this um, saying that his existence is uh, also valid, is legit. So he was constructing this through performativity also. You know, he was responding, you know, to this formula, breaking it, you know, questioning this and saying that he was also Mexican. Doing this uh, over the years with this reiteration of himself. So for me, this, was, this, this is a very strong political discourse, doing this um, and sticking to this, committing to this with these years, okay? So we can see in all of his paintings, he's, uh, he's uh, doing this, um, take, talking about his life, uh, retaining some elements from his childhood and everything that is, uh, you know, his living, living experience. So uh, please, if I, I explain it, or, if, or if I went too simplistic with my explanation of performativity, of course, please read more about any, any book of Jody Butler is good. It's perfect, it's excellent. Uh, but, but of course, I suggest you to start with Gender Trouble and any book, of course, of uh, Paul Preciado. It's also like amazing if, okay, I, I suggest you to start with the Manifiesto Contra Sexual. It's very strong and very political and it's amazing. Okay, so after my PhD, I, I changed just a little bit my line of research and I went uh, into what is called the, the colonial turn or the coloniality. So uh, the decolonial turn is um, part of what is called the critical Latin American thought. It is not new, it's coming from the 90s also, and it is based on the term of coloniality. Coloniality, it was exposed by Aníbal Quijano, and he defined this term as a pattern of power. Okay, so to understand this uh, in a better way, we have to first differentiate colo coloniality from colonization. Colonization is the, um, is the act of occupation, okay, so the occupation of the territory by military force, um, controlling all the resources, um, the people, of course, the economy and the politics. Okay, so 
that what was happening when the Spaniards came to America, to the you know, American continent. And coloniality, it is the pattern that emerged from colonization from that point until now. So we are still living in a condition of coloniality. We have we had our independence, you know, back in the 1810, but we are still living in a condition of coloniality. Okay. So coloniality is deeply related to the concept of modernity. So we often relate modernity, you know, to the enlightenment in Europe in the 18th century, but the decolonial scholars said that uh, modernity came during the, the colonization. Uh, this is, uh, for me, it's like, it's like, it's very curious because they say that when the Spaniards came, they opened like new routes of navigation, new ways of trading. So somehow they like unite this, the, the old continent and they started what is now called, you know, this world system of capitalism. So modernity started with that during the colonization in the 1492. Okay, so it's deeply related to this coloniality. Why? Because with modernity came a, a kind of or sort, sort of rationality. This rationality said that um, the modern rationality express, or oh, yes, express like, um, you know, the, the, they were rescuing the native people from the primitive state, like taking away from the, primi from the primitive state into civilization, the Western civilization, Western European civilization. So we were leaving behind this, you know, knowledge, traditional knowledge that we had before, the knowledge from the land, our dialect, our, you know, uh, everything that we had back then uh, to, you know, to go into this modern world, to go to, to be more civilized or to be civilized at all. Okay. So um, modernity started there, there. And it is related to coloniality. Now, this uh, modernity, uh, as there's an example that is often used by the, the colonial scholars that says that when we are in school, we first learn about uh, the universal history that is no other than the European history. Okay, so uh, the this European history is told. Like is the you know the universal almost the history of humanity, okay? So it is it is a meta narrative. It is like a huge uh, construction or huge fiction that we had to assume when we were uh, during the, the the colonial period and still. So uh, after uh, we learn about the Mexican history as a secondary topic. So we are not nor not, we are not part of this. Um, universal history and we if we are named in this universal history we are named as the other or as the subaltern as the third world you know down low the hierarchy the social hierarchy in, in the world and if we want to be part of this modern world we have to assume these visions of ourselves you know we have to assume this identity uh, and to leave behind all this past, to leave behind all this, uh, and just you know, understand that um, that the, the the best knowledge is the European scientific knowledge, or now the you know the the U.S. European scientific knowledge. So we leave behind everything that we have that we had in the past. Okay. So uh, in the the colonial turn, we have. A methodological tool that is called the situated knowledge. So imagine this meta narrative that's supposed to tell the history of humanity and also guides, you know, this um, progress of development of humanity. Also, like a, if if it was like a lineal progress, 
So it also tells you your aspirations, uh, where do you have to go um, if you want to be, you know, part of the global north or the first world or anything as you want to, I mean, as you want to define it. So the situated knowledge, so this meta narrative is like beyond somewhere that is not rooted in anyone or in anywhere. The situated knowledge means to find yourself, to locate yourself in your day-to-day -day, uh, living experience, in your traditions, in your heritage, in your, I, I don't know, in your dialect, for example, in your personal history, to find yourself in this, construct yourself from this. And also, if you want to be like, to have a political stand, you have to create new knowledge. Knowledge that you have, you know, from that, that comes from you and not, and not from this meta narrative that is away, that is uh, in a metaphysical space. You have to find, you, you have to locate yourself and create your own knowledge, rescue and recover your, your knowledge from the past also. So I think the maestro is doing this also. We can see here in this painting also, it's, uh, sorry, it's black and white, please. Uh, if you want to, I, I, I wanted to show the original painting, you know, with the color and everything, but okay, this, this, uh, I think it's important, this, uh, this painting. Uh, this is uh, the Indio y Española Mestizo. Uh, we can see this representation of this meta narrative, I, I'm telling you. In the, in the right side, we, we see, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish woman. And in the right side, we see, uh, uh, let's say, um, ethnic or indigenous men, okay? So uh, we can see, you know, the sophistication, modernity and wealthy from the European side. And in the other side, we see, you know, the, the primitive, you know, masculinity, rough character uh, that is here in the, this, uh, you know, Mexican uh, man. So we are here, we are, you know, the, the, the child, we are not entirely in our adulthood, let's say. We are not, we are not part of these big meta narratives. We are, you know, the subalterns still. So uh, I think the maestro is doing this. He's locating himself from this situated knowledge. He's finding from his uh, own past. He's retrieving his uh, mother, his grandmother, his, uh, the father figure, his dialect also, because he's handwriting, uh, he's recovering all, all, all of these things from his childhood. So he's constructing this also through time, through his paintings, through, through his artistic career. He's decolonizing himself and decolonizing also the visual arts. Okay, just by doing this situating himself away from this meta narrative. Okay, so I think it's very important and also very political at this time of globalization. Okay, so uh, in the talk I gave in December, I promise uh, someone asked me about this painting. This painting is not from the maestro, it's, uh, it's a painting from Fabian Chaires. And the question was, I promised to answer this uh, because at, the, at that moment in December, uh, the name slipped my mind, I'm, I'm sorry. But now I think it's a very relevant question also to this, what I'm telling you about. Okay, so this is the painting from Fabian Chaires uh, that is called The Revolution. It, it, was, um, it was in an exhibition during the 2020 in the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. And it was very controversial. controversial. Um, we can see um, this iconic figure of Zapata, you know, it's, it's a figure of masculinity, of rough char character, of uh, revolution, of, uh, you know, this, uh, it's, uh, you know, a stereotype of, of a man in uh, Mexico. So we can see now, it's a, I know it's a satirical version of, of Zapata. And, and I think it's raising many questions about um, masculinity. Uh, the main question for me is that uh, what will happen if we put some, uh, you know, macho icon in 
the in the position of representation that often women are, you know, objectified, sexualized, uh, in a position that, you know, these uh, we can see in advertising or even in museums in art that often uh, women are naked, objectified, and everything. So for me, it was like, what if we put this, you know, macho icon in this and uh, the same the same uh, discourse. Um, so for me, this is the main question, and I think it's a very important one now. It's very controversial, but also for me, it's, uh, let's say that he's using the same uh, cultural definitions of or the same elements uh, to put this uh, satirical figure. So he's using these elements of uh, womanhood, let's say, into a man only. So he's not like, he's not um, going beyond this binary uh, system, gender system. He's just using these same, same elements or stereotypes or elements to stereotyping um, women into a man. So in a sense, he's also reinforcing um, this binary system. Um, for me, in the, in, in the other hand, for me, the, the narrative of, of the maestro, because the question that uh, someone asked me last time was if it, if, if it was appropriate to, uh, to find some similarities or some, you know, some differences between the maestro and this work uh, that I show you. And okay, the, similar, the similarities are that um, they both are questioning this um, identity, but they, they, there are some major um, differences. I think the maestro has a very solid narrative, very powerful and very political one that is um, attached to this self-representation. And he's, um, as I told you, he's constructing this identity, his own identity, his own personal history through painting. And he's also decolonizing this uh, new wave of Mexican to contemporary art, just by, by finding himself in painting, by using his own personal history. Okay, so I think he's uh, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century in Mexico, for example. So I admire him very much. And if you want to know more about the, the colonial turn, please um, read um, Walter Miolo and Catherine Walsh these books are here both are like anthologies uh, but you can find many many and different um, articles and scientific papers and the right we have this anthology like Santiago Castro Gomez and Ramon Grossvogel that both both books are like really good of course I I suggest you to also read the colonial feminism for example Aura Cumes or Ochi Curiel that um, they explain very, very well the situated knowledge and they, were, they are using it as, uh, you know, to, to, to create new knowledge. For example, Aura Cumes, she's a researcher and she's also, she, she's also Mayan, Mayan from the, from the Guatemala and this uh, border uh, with Mexico and Guatemala. So she's using this, uh, you know, ancient um, knowledge to construct herself and also you, you know doing research so this is very interesting and to finish my presentation i will read a um, fragment from because the maestro is also writing poetry and also it's it's just a fragment okay so i will read it in spanish in the original language but you can follow my reading in the blue one that is the translation I, it is my own translation, okay, so please um, have that in mind. So I will read it. It's, um, the title is Renacer and says, El inocente no cede a la, a la insistencia de las burlas, piedras que lanzan los culpables. Se consuela en el jardín natural, poema que pervive como madre que alienta su voluntad de vuelo. Prepara el cauce de sus ímpetus, guarda en su memoria la casa, la huerta, el jardín, 
la ceiba, las veredas, el arroyo. Su justo deseo de salvación nutre sus cimientos, condición necesaria del que crea. Siente como si el índice supremo le impusiera la marca del elegido y henchido de gracia se transfigura sin traicionarse en un suntuoso personaje de sí mismo. So I think this uh, poem represents also, you know, the feeling of the of his entire work. His, uh, I think he's uh, recalling some of his past, and he is telling how how he became an artist. So I think that's it from my part. Um, if you have any questions, please, any comments, I'm ready. There are some questions, Sophia. I'm gonna. Yeah. They're a mix of um, YouTube chat and questions. So I'm gonna try and kind of just. Um, and thank you. That was so informative, and that poem was beautiful. It also brought up a lot of things that you can get a lot of these resources at the library. I'm so glad you mentioned all those books. I added them to the doc, and we actually had Judith Butler do a talk. I also put. Um, that link into the um, chat box. Yes, it was mind blowing. And like one of the heroes of my life that I got to check off my, my list of being able to promote. So she, they are amazing. Judith Butler, just, you know, huge in, in the field yes. of gender studies. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so let's see. Um, do you think that um, Nahum felt denied his identity by the, na the nature of the Mexican culture, government, and way of life. Denied his identity. Yes, yes yeah. definitely. If we, just in the question, we see this by nature of Mexican culture. Yes, yes, definitely. If we, if we think this, um, that is uh, something like essentialist version of the identity, the Mexican identity, yes, he was denied. And he also told once that he, when he moved to Mexico City, he found some kind of relief because, you know, in, in between two, 22 million people, you are like almost invisible. So he, feel, he felt relief. So I think he was, he felt denied. So he is very like, you know, uh, with a lot of courage to tell his uh, own history through these paintings, uh, which I don't find exhibitionist at all. He's just telling this, um, constructing this, um, which is part of life, you know, yeah, these kind of uh, nudes and different representations of ourselves. So I think, yes, definitely he felt denied. And that same person just made a comment that there's, you know, so many identities to have to try to be, you know, and the freedoms that we get here in like a different culture where you're, well, even a bubble like the Bay Area, you know, you just step out of the Bay Area, you're not free to be your own identity, but mm -hmm. to be able to, to have these identities that you have to try to be and to conform to, but to be able to find your own and as, as he did through art is pretty amazing. Um, so this person says they've seen more queer and Latino art coming out and being embraced but most of it still by male artists, um, very little by women being embraced. Do you find this to be true? And do you see any kind of change happening on that front? Okay, so I think now there's a strong movement uh, for feminist art also. We have a tradition of feminist art in Mexico that was coming from the, maybe from the 70s also. Um, and it's getting stronger. So I think, yes, it's, uh, the, the, the art uh, done by women is, is getting stronger. It's getting, gaining more visibility. Um, we have, for example, we have a lot of uh, women directors, film directors, a lot of um, that, that they are getting more recognition, a lot of visual artists, so uh, yes, we need more, more support, yes. We need more spaces. We need more independent and alternative spaces uh, to show our work. Uh, but yes, we are gaining more visibility. And I think uh, the feminist movement is getting stronger and stronger every day. So yes. And is, um, 
is art supported sort of in the same way as it is here in America? Like, uh, is there grants and foundations and, um, you know, how are these artists being funded? Uh, yes, there are many grants from the government. Not, not, that, not that many, to tell you the truth. Um, but yes, and also, you know, there are, we need to create our own resources, be, uh, you know, self uh, manage and to find our own, you know, uh, spaces. And we need to find our own sponsors to do our work. Yeah. And it's kind of difficult being, you know, a woman and being an artist that are, you know, <laughs> both together are more difficult. But yes, we can, we need to find these spaces to create a part from, you know, the government uh, grants and scheme or plan. We need to find our independent uh, spaces to express, you know, apart from this uh, institutional uh, discourse, our own uh, speech. So I think we are doing so. We are creating more spaces and we need to find the grants also and sponsors, but we are doing it. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I um, think during uh, shelter in place and the COVID situation, especially in the Bay Area, is really brought about that like community for community spirit and art for, you know, art for the people kind of way of life again. And I really, it's just been a, a wonderful silver lining of pandemic life, but um, yes. I think it just realized how important arts are to our, our life and our sustainability. Um, yes. Sophia, thank you so much. That was such a rich talk. And like I said, it, it opened up a lot of other uh, resources that you can find at our library. And I'm gonna put this in the chat box one more time. You can also watch this again on YouTube and check out all of those books that Sophia talked about yeah. and resources. You know, we got a, a ton of Judith Butler, of course, but also a lot of um, Latinx art, all sorts of amazing stuff. So Sophia, thank you. The Mexican thank Museum, you, thank, you. thank you so much. And um, we appreciate you being here and library community. We'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you bye everyone. Bye-bye.